dramaturg based in New York. I co-founded Beehive Dramaturgy Studio. I'm director of New York at King Company of Broadway. And I also work as a freelance dramaturg. I'm going to sit and open my notebook to the page with my notes on it. <laughs> right, so uh, welcome to this panel, In Practice, New Play Dramaturgy. So uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction, after which I will mostly stop speaking and let these people do a lot of the speaking, and let you, do, and, and let you ch chat with us as well. So when I was thinking after last year's conference about the sorts of discussions I'd find most useful at a future gathering about dramaturgy, I started to think about how grateful I am for opportunities to learn from other dramaturgs and how rare those opportunities are. Uh, applicable tools uh, that I can take, I think about moments in passing with dramaturgs like John Diaz and Janice Perrin and James Leverett and people who I've just picked up such useful things from that I hold on to this day and how that's so much easier for actors who are in rehearsal with each other, getting to observe each other's processes, directors get to assist each other, uh, designers get to assist each other, and you can see the work that designers do on stage. Rarely do dramaturgs get to be in the same room with each other as we're practicing. It's so hard to point out to what dramaturgs are doing on stage. So I was trying to think about opportunities, how we could recreate an absence of actually observing each other in process, could we gather in a conversation for 90 minutes and share something useful and applicable about our practices with each other? Uh, so that is the goal. I have no idea if it's possible, uh, but my selfish curiosity has led to a session that I hope will be useful to all of us. So I brought together these four folks who I really admire. Uh, some of them I know them and how they work a bit because I've gotten to chat with them. Some of them I've really never had a substantive comfort conversation with, but I've admired them from afar, and they did respond to my cold call email, uh, and agreed to chat about their work. And so if this is successful, we will sort of all walk away with something interesting um, that we can apply to our future dramaturgical processes. So I challenge us all to be as uh, specific and thoughtful as possible in thinking about what we really know that we have gathered over the course of our careers that we can share with each other. So, they're going to give a brief introduction to each, um, about themselves. I've asked them to chat just briefly about what they're working on now. And one aspect of new play dramaturgy that they feel they're specifically uh, positioned to talk about, something that they're uh, passionate about, an aspect of their practice they've developed. Uh, that will lead us into a discussion about how we approach a variety of familiar new play dramaturgical challenges. And then I'd like to open it up to conversation with you all, questions from you, strategies you've developed, uh, and that will take us hopefully to 90 minutes. Uh, so if we can just go down the row, uh, and if you can give your names and what you're working on now, and th just uh, a couple of minutes about an aspect of new play dramaturgy that uh, you'd like to speak on. I shouldn't have sat here. <laughs> Hello. Great. Hi, my name is Martine Green Rogers. I am the president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas. I am an assistant professor at the State University of New York at New Paltz. And I also am a freelance dramaturg. And uh, my current work right now, I think there's sort of a twofold thing that's happening in, in my academic life. A lot of what I'm doing is trying to teach students who are either because they're being forced to or because they want to <laughs> learn more about dramaturgy. <laughs> uh, I should probably clarify that. Uh, in the theater studies tract, all the students have to take a dramaturgy course, but whether they continue to keep taking further dives into dramaturgy is dependent on whether or not they are interested in it. So everyone ends up in the introductory course, and then after that, either they come back or they don't. <laughs> and, and, and part of what I do there is try to teach the students how to interact with, uh, with, a, with a living playwright, and so I usually arrange to have 
uh, we dive into a play, I usually end up asking a playwright friend of mine who might want lots of horribly and unsolicited feedback about <laughs> their work. Or maybe I should I should take that back. It is solicited because they signed on to do the thing with us. But we're really interested in having a conversation with a bunch of students about developing a play. Um, and then at the and then I also in my freelance life I work very closely with the Great Plains Theater Conference. And I think in some ways my reflections will deal a lot more with that work and and thinking through that. And then I also. Um, a new piece that I'm going to be working on, I'm going to the Texas Black and Latino Festival um, in San Marcos, and I'm going to be working on a play uh, with Robert Renati and, and Melissa, whose last name I'm blanking on right now, and I apologize, Melissa, if you happen to be <laughs> listening to this right now, I will come up with your last name probably by the time we get down to Skyler. And uh, essentially, uh, to sort of address some of the things that we're talking about, one of the aspects of new play dramaturgy that's really meaningful to me in thinking about my work with Great Plains is really about the idea of who has access to these new works. And I mean that on numerous levels because the Great Plains Theater Conference is located in Omaha, Nebraska. And so, you know, thinking through like that's not necessarily the place where everyone thinks, oh, that is a hub of new play activity, but it actually is in this really amazing way. And What's meaningful to me about that is watching a lot of it, especially to me, uh, writers of color and, uh, and, and trans writers find a place where they can incubate, they can work, and not necessarily have to worry about the pressures of who is in that room looking at me right now, if, if that makes any sense. Because I think especially when people are delving into scenarios and delving into stories that are especially personal, like the thing you don't want to have happen is feel like there's this pressure of, oh my goodness. And, and it's weird because I think people do come to Great Plains Theater Conference who are interested in developing new work, but I think there's also a lot of space to just create and not have to worry about, oh my goodness, who is listening as I create, if that makes any sense. And, that's, and that aspect of it is really meaningful to me because I've been uh, working very closely with uh, Kevin Lawler and Scott, and of course, back to forgetting someone's last name, and I'll remember Scott's last name. Working. Okay. Thank you, Scott Working, thank you. <laughs> yes, President-elect to rescue. Uh, <laughs> um, working with them very closely to really interrogate, because part of, uh, I should probably also clarify, part of what happens at Great Plains Theater Conference is that there are anonymous submissions, but the question is how do we combat issues of bias that can happen in those types of scenarios, and so I've been working with them very closely in order to make sure that we are uh, eliminating uh, places where unintentional bias from the first round of readers could keep plays from marginalized groups. Um, and and uh, from ever actually making it all the way to a round in which we get to look at it, if that makes any sense. So that has been really meaningful to me, and that is probably also where my strong philosophical stance is in terms of the work. Like, I'm about access. That is something that is very important to me, and you'll probably hear it again and again and again over the course of the next few days as I talk about things that are even happening within L LMDA. Access has always been a thing for me. Who gets to be where, when, and why? Um, and so that is where a lot of my energy is and lies in figuring out how do we open up doors as opposed to close doors. And I think in the way of developing a clear practice, essentially a lot of what I think I do is I am reading for potential of story as opposed to like an Aristotelian sense of how a story is being told. I think one of the things I've also been doing is really uh, like, this sounds terrible, but in some ways, like, schooling <laughs> Kevin and Scott on, like, different types of dramatic structures and how those are important in terms of storytelling. And, and we were really thinking about that quite a bit as we discerned which ones. And we actually instituted a new role, um, especially for uh, all, of, all of the... So in general, there's like a ranking system and like anything that gets a certain score or higher automatically like comes to the three of us. 
But we also started doing a just plain out review, even if it's quickly, of all of the other ones, just in case things fall under because someone's like, well, I don't like it because I don't understand the story that they're trying to tell, and maybe it's because they don't understand the structure that they are using in order to tell their story. So going back and having uh, doing things like that really helps to bring in uh, certain plays and it's actually really worked out well in that we have now there are quite a few plays for example that ended up at the festival this year that if we had not done that review would not have made it and they're brilliant stories there are several dramaturgs in this room who were at great plays this year that can tell you that they're just amazing stories that ended up there this year and it is weird to me to think that some of those stories might not have made it if we had not made that shift if that makes sense so anyway, I'm gonna stop talking now. Done. <laughs> You're so amazing. You really are. Stop. I just have to say that yeah. to start with. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Thurmanen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the director of literary development and dramaturgy at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, I've been with OSF now for uh, go for about three seasons, going on my fourth. And uh, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, uh, I have the opportunity, uh, which I really love, to build a cohort and family of dramaturgs for our 11 main stage shows. So in my role, I do dramaturg productions, and I also very much believe that the individual relationship between a playwright, a dramaturg, or a playwright, or a dramaturg and director is very sacred and very unique. So every year, I fight extremely hard for a budget to hire dramaturgs based on playwrights and directors' interests. Um, also because I believe in hiring dramaturgs. More dramaturgs need to be paid for what they do. So that's a big, big thing in new play development. And, uh, and the way I look at it is I often feel like when we talk about new plays, there's often these very deep conversations that we we have about the specificity of what's the right pairing with a director and a playwright, what are the right pairings for designers, and dramaturgs are not always consid considered with the same value construct in that way. So much of what I am trying to push at the festival is how do we look at the value of a dramaturg as a true creative team member that is involved from inception through to fruition in design conferences and every part of the process with that type of thinking. Uh, in addition to that, I also run uh, a new play incubator at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival called the Black Swan Lab. It was started by um, my predecessor and mentor, Louis Douthat, uh, who, yes, big shout out for Louis, yes, 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 who is in week four of the Play On Festival in New York. Let's give her a lot of love. Uh, and uh, and it was a, it was a, a lab that came out of the process of, you know, we're a repertory company with about 90 to 100 actors, 11 shows a season, and with the repertory model, there was deep inquiry and curiosity of how do you develop a new play lab in that setting that all together supports actors being able to talk to playwrights and playwrights being able to develop work without performance pressures or feeling like their plays are auditioned. And uh, I will be the first to say, having been in Oregon, I recognize the geography of where you are in Ashland. You were very far away from cities. And uh, so it was also a deep investment to say, how can we take advantage of the natural environment and the area that we have to cultivate a retreat for writers and allow them to connect with actors and be able to hold those conversations that are around the development of the work. Over the past couple years, uh, I've worked with playwright Luis Alfaro on the development and curation of the writers group, and you know, Luis also has been hugely informative in how do we mentor writers and mentor actors in how they have conversations around new play development. So that's definitely something that I care deeply about. Uh, in terms of the philosophy of new play dramaturgy today, you know, the first thing that I'll say, which very much aligns with Martin's, you know, incredible philosophy and thinking, is I think so much of American theater, we cannot deny, is on the foundation of white supremacy. And when you look at new play dramaturgy, it is often, you know, judged by different formulas that go towards a Western aesthetic and structure. And so with new play development, I feel like one of the most critical things is how do you look at it with a lens that does actually support values of inclusion and equity, and how do you analyze uh, plays from a perspective that can 
globalized storytelling and really support a writer's authentic voice. So I take deep responsibility being in an organization that's 84 years old, where we have definitely promoted white supremacy and we have to now dismantle it and be held accountable for it. And so much of the new play dramaturgy that I really look into and that I push the organization towards is how do we look at who are we included, who are we not including, where does unconscious bias lie, and what are the ways in which we can really support authentic voice from a writer. Uh, so whenever I'm building a relationship with a writer, and it usually is a relationship that starts a year and a half to two years before their play makes the main stage, or if the play is in development, you know, multiple years, I always ask them about how do they like to write? What is their process? What is the environment that they like to write in? Uh, what are some of the resources that they benefit from? And what are some of their dreams for how they see their play coming to fruition? And we build a relationship from there. Uh, those of you who know me know that I also very much believe in a culture of food around new play development. So there's not a single workshop or reading that doesn't have two tables filled with food because we need nourishment when we're birthing plays. Um, and, you know, so I think that it is, the, you know, how, what's the caretaking that's part of that new play dramaturgy that ultimately can support the writer or the ensemble in the development of their work. Because really, as a dramaturg, you get to be a fantastic steward and advocate. And ultimately, I think for writers, it's such a courageous and very isolating situation to hold a play in your head and then put it out on the page. So how can there be support in saying, I recognize this and I'm going to uh, you know, give you the space and the time and the, you know, show respect and value and operate with an analysis that can allow you to bring that play to its best possible potential. So that's that. I'm going to pass it to Skylar. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Skylar Gray and I'm the director of new play development at Victory Gardens Theater here in Chicago. Um, we, what we're working on, so we just opened If I Forget, Stephen Levinson's play, but we also just announced our Ignition Festival. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I was looking at uh, potential schedules all day on how a Tetris game of uh, rehearsals can work uh, with three spaces and six plays in four days. Uh, which sort of brings me to what, when you ask that question, a lot of what I think about when I think about new play development, but also new play dramaturgy, being at Victory Gardens, is new play development through the lens of curator and producer. So a lot of my work as both the resident dramaturg at Victory Gardens, the director of new play development, I'm in charge of all, all audience development, and I'm the line producer on most of the shows, I split that with Kenobi Jones. And so a lot of the work that I do with new plays is deeply rooted in the organization um, in terms of how we curate both our season and our festivals, but also how we pair everyone from directors to dramaturgs um, to even the production assistant, like who is in that room. A lot of that falls to my department. And so what I, what I like to think about a lot is how we're talking about new play development, both with our audiences, but also with our staffs, and what the responsibility is when we're bringing in playwrights working on new plays who are interacting with our staffs, who are also the ones who are communicating their vision to our audiences, and what those audiences are bringing in perception-wise into the reading. So it's all just a giant cycle. And so a lot of what I have to do is everything from you know, scheduling it, but also working with marketing in terms of how are we talking about this show? Because the worst thing is to bring an artist into your space and they read the brochure, which went out 20 years ago and there's nothing they can do about it. And they go, oh, who's that? Whose play is that? And you're like, oh, that's your play. And so, so much of what it is a Victory Garden, since we are smaller, is everyone has a hand in the new play process, but also making sure that they know how to communicate that. And then when we have audiences in, whether it be for Ignition or the world premieres we do, a lot of that is helping them, giving them the resources to go into the play so they can appreciate where the play is at that point in its process. So when we are talking and we are having talkbacks, which we have after every single show at Victory Gardens, is 
Do they know how to talk about new play development if it is a world premiere? And what's happening in the preview process? Where the playwright is with that process? So then our audiences are also coming to see the shows, having a better understanding of what both new play development is, but also what the future of American theater is and can be. And a lot of that is when we're looking for plays, sort of what you were talking about is what excites me most about that, what my philosophy is on new play development, is that we're in an age where anything is possible and people are doing those plays, but it's our responsibility to keep that going. And so when I read a play that's four and a half hours long and has a cast of 10 and say, oh, we might not produce that, I have to check myself and say, oh, actually, maybe we should produce that at, which we're doing next year, um, <laughs> was one of those plays that I saw and was like, there's no way, like, there's no way we'll ever do this. It's too big. But like, that's what's exciting about new play development is anything is possible once I'm able to step back and say, I have to keep those barriers out of my mind. Otherwise, that's sort of what we're, we're putting barriers on the whole future of the American theater. And then these plays happen and we're like, oh my God, where did that come from? And you're like, oh, I got that three years ago. And I said like, oh, it had a kid in it, so we'll never do it. And like, what are those barriers that are keeping us so real? Kids and animals? People are like, no, thank you. Um, but like, what are those barriers that we're putting on plays and how can we break those down just on a basic level? So that's where a lot of, I'm sort of rambling right now, but it's like the eye of the curator and the producer is just sort of integral to what I have to do at VG. Hi, my name is Amy Jensen. I'm a freelance dramaturg based in New York City. Uh, for the past several years, I've been working on shows that are TYA pieces um, at different festivals. I've also been working on pieces that are puppetry pieces with some good friends who are designers and directors. And I went into writing about my philosophy. I felt like um, the biggest thing that I come back to over and over again, um, the role of questions in the creative process, I think, is generally an accepted importance. We recognize that questions can bring up uh, a lot of openings. Questions can invite creation. Questions can invite a lot of things in the room itself. It's a rewarding experience um, to have asking a question and then having that lead to other thoughts and insights. Um, recently, uh, director, dr divisor that I was working with texted that I love your questions and I always hate them at first. <laughs> they make my brain fizzy and force me to think. And I liked the word fizzy. To me it has an idea of synergy to it as well and a catalyst. And I think those are great things. It's also a little bit, uh, it's a good humbling moment too because as much as I want to say like, oh, great question, that almost always what happens is that thing leads to that thing leads to that thing, so that now we're like several blocks, if not miles away from the first question that I asked, but we're at a really great spot where the person who has the answers has found them themselves. Um, and uh, I've also personally found that I think questions are incredibly important for my own practice because I need to be um, thinking I need, I need that in the way that you're talking about breaking up your own assumptions. I think uh, questions push me to think beyond the first comment, the first analysis that push me to think, well, what is, what is the way that I can present this or think about this in a way that's not, that leaves opening and a place to go that pushes me. Sometimes the questions come easily and those are nice. Sometimes the questions just fall to the side and they're duds and some of the questions take quite a while to get under, like, what is that? What, where is, what is that question? Um, and sometimes they don't fully come. And that process, I think, is really important for me. And I feel like um, there's a question pushes me to think, I still have more to learn in my practice. I appreciated, um, Liz Engelman mentioned a book that I guess is written for business management um, called more great questions and its thesis is that there's a pattern and asking questions that you start out with more of the why questions and then you ask more of the what if questions and then you ask more of the how questions 
I thought, oh wow, uh, the, the thinking of questions is also fascinating to me. And this past year, I've really resonated a lot to um, interviews. I really personally care a lot about interviews. Um, and oral history and was talking to some oral historians and learning how they put together what they would call um, blueprints and the way they spoke about doing a pretty exhaustive outline essentially of the things that they needed to prepare, insisting that once they've done all of this exhaustive work not to take, not to write down any of those questions because that would make them feel tied and a little bit less um, improvisational in the moment of the interview but that they would be able to have be drawing all of that with them. And I thought, oh, that sounds also quite obviously dramaturgical. So it's uh, something I'm looking forward to trying out in future um, projects. And so, yeah. Uh, thank you all for those thoughtful introductions. Uh, so the next part of the session, we're going to jump into uh, some questions I developed with these folks and with Jackie Goldfinger, who couldn't be here, but was instrumental in organizing the session. Uh, so these are some questions about new play dramaturgy challenges that uh, we come across, and I would love responses that are both practical and philosophical. Uh, Amy, so since you brought up that book you read, which isn't specifically a dramaturgical text, uh, I'm curious about uh, more books that have been instrumental to the way you think about dramaturgy, or your freelance practice in general. They can be specifically dramaturgical or not. And, Yours was called More Great Questions, and maybe we can have our note takers uh, start to put some of these titles on the pad. Uh, yeah, well, that one is, um, or I think a more beautiful question. I'm sorry, it's by Berger or something like that. I'm now feeling. Uh, I think, um, well, I don't necessarily always use, I don't, I mean, some of the books, as you asked this question, I was like, well, how much do I actually pull that one out? But I think things that have informed um, thinking uh, include the Eleanor Fuchs article about the, the planets. Visit to a small planet. Small planet. Yes. Yep. Um, Visit to a small planet. Visit to a small planet. That asks so many questions. Uh, and I think sometimes it feels like, well, that's not practical to ask all of those questions in a project. But I think sometimes it's just the perspective thinking of, of where you're stepping in and out of. Um, I think too that um, being aware of other processes that, as you spoke of, different structures besides Aristotelian ones, although by and large I'm very much working in a story structure that functions along those, to have come across um, viewpoints and Mary Overly's work in redefining what centers work um, and uh, like what the idea of William Forsyth's choreography, just where it recenters what the floor can be, where it recenters all of these things, kind of make me feel like remember everything is shiftable, really. Um, you have to keep that in mind. Um, I feel like while it's less directly about the artistic process. Uh, I've recently enjoyed the book, Thanks for the Feedback, which is about how we receive feedback. And I think as someone who has often given feedback without necessarily understanding the emotional work that comes in being on the receiving end of feedback, uh, I think I appreciated that perspective too. Yeah, I'm writing. So. I'm writing. No, um, so a lot, I will co-sign on the Eleanor Fuchs article for sure. Um, also, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, because uh, I think in terms of thinking through how we make snap judgments about things, like we, you know, I think in some ways as as readers of new text, there's always like that bit of like I feel, like or I, you know, and and, and really asking ourselves to go back and rethink through like how are we making these judgments about what is of value. Um, is useful, at least it was to me. I also think, even though I don't think he's here yet, but he'll be here soon, uh, Michael Chemer's book, Ghost Light, is a good one, um, especially in terms of the, uh, thinking through, especially as we get new types of structures, like some of the questions that he asks about, like uh, dual protagonists, things like that, are super useful in thinking through new structures. So, yeah, those are, the, the, those are my thoughts, and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Great. Uh, I will probably not remember everything that I want to say, so hopefully there'll be a follow-up where we can share more resources, but uh, a few that come to mind, I, uh, when I first started studying dramaturgy, and uh, well, Shelley Orr was one of my professors in dramaturgy, and uh, the resources that I received were really widespread, and then from college I also uh, spent some time uh, studying with the City Company, and then also was with Double Edge Theatre, a fantastic ensemble in Asheville, Massachusetts for several years, and uh, during that time of uh, the study with the City Company, I started reading Anne Bogart's blogs, um, many of which, you know, the, the philosophy and the ethos are now in a number of books, but I, uh, she particularly had a blog series that was very focused on the construction of storytelling, which I found incredibly meaningful in terms of thinking about what's the story and how we tell stories. And, uh, and then also, uh, during my time with Double Edge, uh, the company is, uh, there's many different practices and training methodologies that the company holds, uh, but one of which is the uh, practice of Grotowski's Laboratorium. And uh, I was very inspired in uh, learning about Grotowski's dramaturg, Ludwig Flaxen, who was a company dramaturg and uh, wrote an incredible book, uh, Grotowski and Company, that uh, not only shares his own dramaturgical process, but documents the narrative and storytelling of the company. And what was particularly meaningful in that moment is as someone who has gone between being a production dramaturg to a company dramaturg or resident dramaturg or institutional dramaturg, I'm always so curious about those different threads around you know, how you dramaturg for a project and build relationships with writers and how you also support the dramaturgy of a company and the narrative of a company and the way in which a company programs and how the trajectory of programming can be supported and thought about. And this book was so holistic in the way in which Ludwig talked about how he was charting the company's philosophy and training as well as serving as an individual production dramaturg. Uh, and then I will say I also, uh, I always look for, you know, similar to what you know Amy was sharing, I always look for ways in which I can uh, respond to feedback and, and criticism, how criticism can be generous and also transparent at the same time. And so the practice of Liz Lerman and what she speaks to in terms of towards a critical response has been informative. Oh, oh, and one more, one more. Uh, uh, the final one that I will say uh, that I have to say both applied to my process dramaturgically with thinking of new play dramaturgy, but also to many other facets of my life uh, was um, a book that my former mentor, uh, David Dower, introduced to me called uh, Sh uh, Switch by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. And uh, the book is about how to make change when change can be hard emotionally, physically, structurally. And what I love about that book is when thinking about new play dramaturgy, change is inevitable. You know, change is perhaps the only constant. And the way in which we respond to change as dramaturgs, as other collaborators, is something that I always consider in the process of collaboration. And the book itself talks about different strategies and opportunities to invite change and to receive change in a positive way in order to help build a process. And it was really eye-opening in terms of thinking about not only how do I navigate as a dramaturg, but how do I respond to actors and other collaborators who see a change in a script and view that as a negative <laughs> and actually get that shift towards positivity around the process of change and evolution. We don't all need to answer all the questions if we don't all have really strong answers, but, but you're welcome to, Skylar, if you want to go through I mean, I'm a garbage human, and I have never read a book on dramaturgy in my life. Um, what up? Uh, but what I have found extremely helpful in my process is we partner with a lot of social justice organizations here in Chicago, and so I go to their talks and watching how other community organizations here in Chicago are asking questions of the people within their community, but also the way their organization partners with the same community I think I know, and what questions they're asking that same community has been incredibly informative to my process. But that's not a book, so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, thinking about the way that you get, in, that you sort of get to know a new player you're developing, this is 
privileging text-based work. So aside from reading it a lot of times, aside from asking questions of the writer about what their intent was, we all we know about that. Are there other things you do for yourself as part of your practice just to get familiar with the work? This isn't not for the benefit of the writer or the team, but like I'm trying to figure out my connection to this play. Is there a specific kind of research you do? Is there a specific set of questions you ask yourself? Is there a specific kind of structural outline you do for yourself? And the answer might be no, or it completely depends on the play. But I'm curious. I got something. Um, for me, to be honest, I think some of what I like to do is experience the world of the play, if it's possible at all. And so, like, this is going to sound really wild, but, you know, and, and it just actually was also kind of a bit of, like, luck in that I was already planning to do something like this anyway, but I remember working on Hannah and the Drake Gazebo as a research dramaturg at OSF, and I was like, well, I have an opportunity to go to South Korea if I want to, so let's go. And so I actually spent some time actually doing things like, I mean, it, it probably, probably looked like the silliest person on the planet, but it was actually really helpful in the room. Like, uh, so when the dad has to like bike up the hill, I actually like went to that space and actually tried to bike up the hill just to see like, what, what would that be like? <laughs> like, you know, and, and, and you know, in some ways, some of that actually sort of infiltrated the production that we did in terms of thinking through like, where's that point where she realizes that you know, he, she's being lied to about where he is in that moment because he's not necessarily behaving in the way someone would if they were actually doing that thing that they said they were doing. Um, and then, you know, I'd like to experience things. I, there's a, a play that I worked on a really long time ago that was set on a roller coaster. So I was like, I wonder what it'd be like to try and have the kind of conversations that they're having on a roller coaster. And so I... <laughs> I, I forced my, my, my poor spouse who hates roller coasters to <laughs> go on some with me and see if we could have conversations about the things that they were having conversations about and what would that actually, like trying to just experience the world of the play. So, I mean, that's not necessarily like a text thing, but that's kind of one of the things that I love to do to see like, what does it feel like to be in those situations? And, and, and I think it's actually more for my own process than necessarily, like sometimes that information becomes helpful in a room, but usually it's just about like, what is this? Like, what, what is it about, for example, like plummeting numerous like feet or like miles or whatever in the air? Like, what is it about that that might bring an existential crisis of some sort <laughs> that one needs to reckon with one like higher power? Like, what are, you know, what are those things? So just trying to experience that has been useful to me. If, if, if possible, I know it's not always possible. Like, I got lucky that I got to go to South Korea at the same time that I was working on that play. But, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I think there is something for me, too, that always thinks about the journey of a play being one that is truly a sensory experience. And how, how do I look at my research from, you know, what I glean from the page to actually imagining and dreaming of it theatrically. So in those opportunities, I do try my best to find different aspects or facets of the research that can be uh, informed by activating a piece of the world or, you know, trying to see a piece of the world or taste it or smell it or connect with it in some way. Uh, so I, I was working on a play that uh, was specifically dealing with the setting in, uh, in Walt Disney World and had the opportunity while I was traveling just to go to Walt Disney World and kind of feel, you know, what the energy of the play was and what it was speaking to and what its commentary was. Uh, so that, I love those elements where you can actually start to feel the world in a very real and rich and human way. Uh, another practice that I have for some projects but not all, but uh, I worked with a director uh, who loves to chart uh, a play through an image storyline. So when they're constructing their vision for a piece, they will find images that capture the essence or the feeling or meaning of a play, and they will string them together in essentially their own image PowerPoint or, or board. And uh, I was working um, on a piece that was hugely imagistic in terms of the writer's desire for how it would be depicted on stage. And so I ended up doing that as a collaborative research project with them, which was really informative to just think of how you, you know, what, what is communicated through image and what you witness through the visual narrative. And that was, that was meaningful. Uh, and I'll also 
say this, uh, when I was working with Double Edge Theatre as their dramaturg and as uh, an associate producer, Double Edge always starts their process of building work, uh, which often takes about two years as they work in a laboratory setting. Uh, they always start their process with no text or vocalization of language. And so they have a training methodology where you essentially start to physicalize your body to manifest ideas or a question or a point of storytelling. And then as the dramaturg, you have the opportunity to both train with the company and then also observe the company and see what images you can pull out for storytelling. Uh, and that was hugely informative as someone who, before that time, was working strictly text-based and really looking at plays in terms of you know what I was gleaning from the words on the page and being able to say, what if we start with image and physicality and then build the text from there? I don't necessarily enjoy doing scene breakdowns, like French scene breakdowns, but I find when I haven't done them just for myself, I regret it. <laughs> It's just, I think, uh, just forces me to pay attention to more detail and time and things like that, that I just need to have that facility when I get in the room. I mean, I think other than the rabbit hole that we all go through where you Google something and then 20 hours later you emerge and you're like, I don't know how I got to this thing, uh, but I was into it the whole time. Uh, Aside from that, something that's been really neat uh, with the last two commissions we've had at VG is uh, we actually bring in the playwright and then they get to meet with uh, people who are doing the work uh, here in Chicago and then they go off and they'll write their play. And initially we had them going off on their own um, and I wasn't going on the meetings with them. And then they would come back and be like, oh my god, I had these amazing meetings and there's so many great things that this person said and I would be like, <laughs> Shit, I should have I should have gone with you. Um, so something that we shifted up is now I'll go with the writer to have all of these meetings. So I'm getting all of that. Not only am I getting the facts and the information and the personal stories, but I'm also able to capture the emotion mentally of how it is told and in what lens it is told. Because sometimes I'll hear something and I'll be like, how interesting that they said that. But then you see how they say it, and it's totally different than it was recounted in the game of telephone. So that's less text-based, but it's more like doing the research with the writer. Of course, we're not always able to do that, and that's a very nice uh, process, but is not always feasible all the time. But like being able to share that root knowledge from the get-go has really shifted how we're able to have those conversations and then holistically bring in those same groups to then talk about the play during the play. Um, and you, you've seen those people talk about their experience and then they get to talk about their experience two years later. That has been really neat. Again, not text-based. I promise I read. <laughs> uh, we've talked a bit about visuals. I find that when I'm working with playwrights, uh, sometimes I get stuck in a loop of conversation about their play. Bringing some visual representation of the structure of the play to them can be very useful. Uh, and, and so I'm curious what that process has looked like for you. We know the post-it note version and the index card version, we can move things around. Uh, sometimes I've sort of explored with playwrights about when you put their play on, you know, the, Aristos, the Aristotelian scene chart, what it looks like, or put in another scene sort of structural chart, what it looks like. I'm wondering if you've had experience, I know you brought up um, the, image, you know, the images for each scene. Uh, any other sort of visual worlds you've sort of used to represent to writers what they've already made that have opened up conversation. I'm a little ashamed to admit this, but I've had some gift conversations with playwrights. Like, in that, I'm like, I just read your play and it made me feel like, <laughs> and then I said the gift. <laughs> but, but I think sometimes, like, you need sometimes, like, something that has happened in pop culture, whether it's like a sponge, you know, SpongeBob moment where, like, <laughs> he covers himself in sand, and you're like, that is how I felt after I read your play. Can sometimes convey a little bit more than be trying to like express that, if that makes any sense. Um, and so I have been known to do things like that. I have also been known to send a playwright um, 
things, uh, images that have been conjured for me. And what I mean by that is like if or or uh, lists of, and not in that in that I think they are similar, but you know I I read something and it makes me think of uh, like songs. And so and so I've charted I've charted a play and song before in terms of like my emotional journey reading it and uh, I think especially for this particular playwright that actually worked a lot better than trying to chart it any other way like you know because I think it was a play that was meant to go on an emotional roller coaster and sometimes it's not always easy to like explain that emotional but if I can translate it into a different art and say here this is the here have a mixtape because we don't do mixtapes anymore even though I feel like it's a lost art we should hand people CDs like a mixed CD and be like listen to this this is, this is what I felt. I curated this specifically for you. But like those are things that I do, and maybe that says a lot about me as a human being in terms of how I process new work, but I'm always doing weird things like that, <laughs> which probably might, or maybe not, drive my playwrights crazy. <laughs> in times when we've, uh, in the process, specifically worked on structure that way, I found that it helped for it to be movable. Um, so in a devised piece where, I don't know, there were probably 100 post-it notes all over the wall from different ideas and images, and then um, together as, the, in the, as a group, we were organizing them and tossing the ones that had, the ideas had disappeared or whatever. Um, and I think that, um, that helped later conversations uh, in a different situation where it was literally putting the pages on the floor to look at some specific scenes that had some great similarities, wondering about their structure, and that that representation with the director and me and the playwright enabled that to be a conversation where we could actually ended up switching how things went. But I think part of that was because it was movable, it was changeable, and it was something that we did together versus um, I don't know if I would feel the same thing would happen if I just gave someone a representation. I read an article recently about um, in which a, I guess a dramaturg had taken to someone a script and said, well, I changed this for you. <laughs> of course, that did not go down well. Um, and I think it's uh, the, the ability to move and shift and, and see it at the same time is helpful. Oh, okay. uh, we've talked a little bit about the role of uh, audience engagement in new play dramaturgy, uh, and so I'm curious about how you think of uh, the audience side work on a new play versus a revival of a play. Um, and in any context where an audience is coming in, it might be a workshop where an audience is, visit is attending, or a world premiere. Uh, what is your responsibility to the playwright and to the play differently there from when it's an established work? I'll go. Um, I mean, I think, I think the big thing is for us, when we are doing something like Ignition, which we allow the playwrights to write literally up until the audience walks in, and then they can still <laughs> keep passing post-its if they want, um, that like what the audience is seeing is a snapshot of the play. Like this is, this is where the play is at this point. This is the way we intended it. The playwright did not go rogue and decide to keep writing until the last minute. This is the nature of how we incubate new plays here. And what that means is, what you're seeing right now is just where it is right now. And then what is obviously great, and many of us will know, is when they come see the world premiere that you do a year and a half later, they're the first to dramaturgically come up and be like, oh, he changed this, and he changed this, and then it moved over here, and then I saw that, and that wasn't in the reading. And you're like, totally. And, the, and I think, Part of that is setting expectations that what they're seeing is organic and changeable and movable and malleable. And they pay attention closer, I think, when you've set those rules, because they know that what they're seeing is a child at age three 
So when they go to the kid's graduation, they're like, I remember you at age three. It's like, it is very much the same sort of thing that like once we know that this moment will shift this person's experience for the rest of their life, this reading will shift this play's life for better or worse, you never know. But like, you were there at that moment and people really pay attention. And that has been very instrumental both in getting audiences invested in new plays for us, but also in terms of being able to communicate with playwrights that like what they're going into is they're sort of talking about what hit them as opposed to like what they didn't get. And yes, those conversations are great and I don't know what they're having, you know, when they see the playwright in the lobby, but like what they're giving are supportive, uh, whether or not they have questions, it's coming from a place of love in the hope that the play continues on this beautiful journey, as opposed to us saying, okay, it's done, who didn't get what? It's like, that is the most damaging thing to a play, let alone if you don't give those expectations, they think it's done, or they think that this is it. And they have thoughts, and we're in a world of talkbacks where everyone has thoughts and they want to share those thoughts. So it's letting people know what space they're in, um, but also letting the playwright know that you know what space you're in. And it's, it's that that's really set up audience engagement in terms of new plays and both an investment and an understanding of where we are. Kind of to echo that, I feel that um, playwrights, that many of them I've felt like they've ex appreciated understanding what people have experienced, the more phenomenological or whatever you want to call it, the images, the moments that have resonated, that they take away, that, that they feel keep with them, that live with them. Um, they're much less, most of them have been much less interested in any analysis of what does it mean along those lines of getting it or reading it, the semiological whatever experience. and that there's a lot of intellectual joy and pleasure in, in that kind of analysis and, and reading, but that generally for a new play that is just less of a help at that point. And I think that gets to be tricky because I've heard several times when people will introduce uh, a, a talk back afterward of, well, this is a new play, so what you say will change what the writer is going to do. And I've heard many comments where people then feel kind of empowered to essentially tell people what they should change. And um, that's, uh, you know, I don't think that's a constructive thing. I think it's always been interesting when I'm help, asked to help the playwright or be participating with a playwright and figuring out exactly what questions do you pose. Um, I've appreciated that many playwrights are ready to run that. They ready. They have an idea already, what is useful for them and what isn't useful. Um, but I do think that there's a way that along the lines of helping the process and the audience knowing that just your experience and what resonates with you, that is a gift. That is really a gift. You don't need to analyze it for it to like be what the playwright needs. They really want to hear what, what connects. Um, I will also echo both of you shared. You know, I think that uh, I, I love this term gift because I do think I do think plays are gifts, and I do think that the the way in which an audience can actually be uh, connected to a play and recognize it as an incredibly sacred and you know special opportunity to witness a world premiere is absolutely you know a philosophy that uh, I know I try my hardest to you know just enforce with an audience and you know and I, I, when I'm talking to audiences I often talk about the reality of you know a play finding itself through multiple productions that you know how can you expect a play to fully find itself in the first production you know without the ability to actually be able to discover its relationship to an audience and for a writer to be able to take a longer journey with it uh, and so you know it really is you know building in that sense of how can we treat this as an opportunity as opposed to a platform for you know what you are not seeing or how you need to fix something or make it prescriptive uh, whether writer 
writer is open to it, I also do love to contextualize and share their process because I think ultimately that is a very human to human connection with an audience and a playwright to say, you know, what is the context of their process? What is the root of inspiration for a work and where has it, its journey been and where is the playwright going with it? So we do have um, a number of different panel conversations that we have at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival where writers, if they are willing, can share more of the process-based work so that that is part of what informs an audience's relationship to it and recognizing that this is a, a moment in the present but not necessarily a moment of permanence of how the play could live and breathe. Uh, and then the final thing, you know, with um, the Black Swan Lab, uh, we do not have an audience for it. it. The lab is constructed so that there is no audience uh, and we are around a table witnessing the work, but we have a body of actors who are always part of the lab reading cohort whenever we have a reading. And as an actor, if you are not reading in that particular day, you are still coming to the lab as a listener and you are still responding in the post-reading conversation that we, uh, we have the Liz Lerman structure for. Um, and that is also a great opportunity where I realize that is a form of audience engagement from the actor in terms of they, you know, they are not participating directly in the reading process, but they are responding and they are actually part of the audience for the work. And much of that training is looking at how do we look at an actor's dramaturgy with the sense of you are a listener and a responder, but not someone who is attempting to change the play towards your best. Benefit. So how are we thinking more openly towards the writer's process and their sense of development and holding that together? I think in some ways I also like to use audience engagement literally. And what I mean by that is I, am, I, I like to call myself a dramaturgical lurker. And so I, I, if, if I have a choice, I will always sit in the back of a house when a reading is happening and, and watch people. And a lot of times what I will do, um, especially in terms of a practical and try to, and, and to solicit feedback that is uh, helpful, you know, besides obviously just having the conversation with the playwright and asking them what is useful, I will also, if I notice, for example, that there is a moment where you can collectively see everyone's butt clench. Because <laughs> it's amazing what you can kind of read when you watch like the backs of people. Like, you know, if everyone goes, you'll see, you can see that happen. Um, you will also see moments where people start to like, like slide in yeah. to a play where they get or lean yeah. in. Yeah. Um, I will ask questions around that. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, I, you know, where's that moment in which you felt your body physically lean in? You know, and why? Because I think that in some ways that's the good, the good thing. Like, what is it about that that just made someone lean in? Um, I know, especially like I know that I've watched, for example, Amritha watch me watch a play <laughs> in which I'm gone. <laughs> and I will literally be like, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and that's because there's a moment where my brain is like firing on multiple cylinders and it's not always you know a bad or a good thing it's just like something has been activated in me um, and I think those kinds of reactions are really great to mind sometimes in these conversations in order to a keep them positive and useful but then also what is that thing that people are or not, because I think that so what's also been interesting in conversations are those movements when you see like maybe half of an audience lean in, but then you see half of an audience lean out. Mm -hmm. So have we really hit on some nerve where like some people are like, yes, give me more. Some people are like, whoa, we've got, you know, and where's that, where's that line? What has happened that has created that? So I love those kinds of questions um, and poking at an audience in order to make conversations happen. We've talked a lot about uh, programming and selection process, and dramaturgs are often in a good position to advocate for uh, improvements and expansions of, of those. And so I'm curious about um, the moments when you faced your own barrier. And Skylar talked a little bit about this, about like, oh, I have this barrier and I've removed it. About there, have there been moments for yourselves where a way of thinking about programming or a way of, or an awareness of like, oh, I know this body of plays and I'm missing this body of plays. Like, when you've reached that moment, what has that been and how have you moved yourself through it in a way that might be useful to share in a room? I can, I can share it. So I think in my experience, some of the root of what you're asking is also, uh, to me, there's, I find genuine joy in selecting plays for fun things. And so 
one, if I find myself in a situation where I'm getting tense about it, then I know something has gone awry in some way. And so it's about, in some ways, dramaturging myself and saying, like, what is, what, why have I lost joy in this thing that I know that I genuinely find joy in? And sometimes that is, you know, outside influences about what people feel like we need. And, and I, I find that a lot of the way that I personally try to figure and navigate some of that is about asking, like I just dramaturg the situation, I start asking questions. Like, okay, you're saying that you need, we need this for our season. Okay, here are numerous plays that do that. So if you're saying that none of these work, what is it that they're not doing that, you know, what, what is that thing that I'm missing? And so I can potentially wrangle that. Um, I'm going to keep thinking more because I'm going to stop rambling about that specific thing, but I feel like I have a lot of thoughts that are coming to the surface and they're not coherent, so come back to me. <laughs> I mean, what I've also learned is in curating and producing a season or a festival or whatever it may be, sometimes the best way to uh, advocate for a play is to not let no stop you. Um, and what I mean, I'm not like going rogue, like Che's gonna watch this and be like, what? <laughs> um, but what I mean by that is like, if you, if you get a no and you really believe in the play, to just say, okay, it's out. Like, what does that mean? And then to keep it on the list, on your consideration list or, or however you do it or in your drive or your Google Doc or whatever it is, like, if you don't get rid of it, you, it's always there to remind you what you loved about it. And when you're having those conversations of like, oh, well, we found five that we really agree upon, like, we're missing something, it's so easy to say, well, six months ago, we read this play that wasn't right then, but like, here it is. And it's, I think it's, it's so easy to get a no and be like, I'm not gonna fight that, like, or, eh, you know, maybe it isn't right. But, like, those plays that I truly believe in, the longer I keep them on the list and the longer I know why I kept them on a the list is, like, instrumental for me to know, like, that's what stuck with me. And that it has a lasting impression. And so just keeping things even annoyingly on my own, <laughs> on my own documents has just been so helpful in terms of like what those barriers were at that at that point, or what we were looking for at that point, and what we're now looking for. And those plays, it's amazing how often they haunt you and find their way back in. Uh, but when they do, it's even sweeter, because you know that this was a play that affected you for three years, four years, or you pass it along to a colleague, and they're able to do it, and you just watch that the play continues to haunt you. One challenge that I, I was thinking about with that with that question, Jeremy, that we face at, at OSF is when we're programming, we typically start reading plays about two years to a year and a half before they're actually in rehearsal on the main stage. And we have a process where we have a large body of company members across every single department, almost, who are part of a reading group to curate the plays. And so uh, this past year, it was 60 company members who were all reading plays on a curated list and responding to their uh, their desires or interests or curiosity with the play and also sharing their critical feedback. And uh, particularly with new plays, what I found happens at a place like OSF where you are you know, looking at a season that is balancing many different genres uh, of plays and everything from Shakespeare to you know contemporary work to world premieres is the way in which world premieres would be critical Criticized against plays that have had five productions and not recognizing the variance between, you know, for the, the broader reading group, the state of a play and how can we look for its potential and possibility. And so much of the conversation had to become about 
how do we invite the writer's voice into the process? So I would get feedback from the writer about the state of the play and their process to be able to share with the reading group. And how can we start to look for the seeds of the ideas that we hope to grow and what we're committed to in terms of supporting the development of a play and seeing that potential? Because ultimately, it's inequitable if you're comparing a play that is in its first draft to something that has had 27 drafts. And yet, when you have a reader's group and they look at the plays, they're going to say, well, the 27 draft, that's the play that we should produce because look at where it's at. Well, you know, that's a great play. It's like, well, how do we look at, you know, how do we chart potential? And so I think often the advocacy becomes from, becomes one of possibility and then holding accountability and responsibility for following the play through once it's committed to. Once it's programmed, we then have the responsibility to make sure it is properly resourced and supported and developed in a way that allows it to move into a successful production. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the other thing that, that came to mind as well is just, you know, in, in a programming cycle, uh, you know, there's always a sense of risk taking that should be held as, uh, you know, with joy and desire. And I know often when communicating with uh, other departments at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, we usually have these great and necessary debates about, you know, a play's potential within the season, uh, but we're also trying to predict that a year and a half before it will actually be shown. So how we consistently check ourselves in saying, we may have an idea of what it will be like in production now, and we also have to accept that we are taking the risk and we desire the risk because we have no idea what it could be like a year and a half from now and allowing that. And a great example from this season, we worked with uh, the 1491s. Um, we commissioned them for our American Revolution's United States history cycle. And when we programmed the play, uh, it's five ensemble members of the 1491s who created this incredible piece called Between Two Knees that really charted... Um, from Wounded Knee, uh, the Battle of Wounded Knee, to the occupation of Wounded Knee over the cycle in a highly um, you know, comedic style. Uh, if anyone follows them on YouTube, you'll get a sense of what their aesthetic is. And when we were looking at programming, they had an outline of the play. They did not have anything that they had written, but they said, this is where we're going. Here's our outline. And we had to take responsibility as an organization to say we believe in them as artists, and we're going to commit to building this outline into a play. And and allowing that to be what we are responsible for in the collaboration. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. I've still got a lot of burning questions on my list. <laughs> but I want to open this up at this point to if, you, if questions have developed for you that you'd like to ask each other, if questions have developed for you that you'd like to ask them, or if anything has come up that you've been like, ooh, I've had a strategy for that and I'd really like to share that with the group, this would also be a good time for that. So first off, is there anything that, as we've been coming up, there doesn't need to be, uh, like, oh, I would really like to ask this group how they tackle blank. I have one. That's, yeah. that's a hard question, but I really, I, I, want, I want to learn from my colleagues here. Uh, in a new play dramaturgy process, when you're working with a playwright or ensemble director, and the director is highly dramaturgical and involved in the writing process, what, how do you navigate as a dramaturg those moments when there are director, playwright, or ensemble conflicts? Like, what is the balance in terms of how you navigate that relationship? My face is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, got, I got one. Yeah. I'm going to... Uh, I was just thinking about a situation where something like that happened, and to be honest, uh, you actually do this in a different way, but food. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, uh -huh. at getting everyone to go have so a I meal. Have a meal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the only reason why is because I think sometimes, especially when those conflicts are happening, sometimes it's because people feel like they aren't being heard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just like breaking down, like this idea of like, okay, well, at least I know now I'm being heard, even if I, the thing that, the outcome that I want is not happening, at least I know that people are listening now. I don't know, like I usually solve, I try to solve things with food. <laughs> uh, so th that's my first thought. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Well, as someone who works for a playwright director, yeah. um, <laughs> what I have actually found is the more, like initially in my mind, it's like, oh my god, the director's asking too many dramaturgical questions. Like, we gotta shut this down. Like. <laughs> 
Like, once I was able to sort of settle into the idea that those questions can be 20 times better than any question I have, and can be 20 times better than any question the playwright has asked themselves, I think, like, having those open conversations and giving the playwright the agency to say, like, oh, that's actually not what I'm interested in, and being there for them when they want to have that conversation, but also being open to the fact that these questions can be amazing, um, has been extremely crucial, both for me, but also in the process, is, you know, you're not the smartest person in the room. They probably aren't either. The writer is. But they probably are going to ask a question that the writer hasn't thought about, and neither have you. And that's why there's three of you, yeah. as opposed to just two of you. Yeah. Um, and so that's been really liberating in terms of approaching those from a like, oh, let's, what do you got? Like, what question are you asking? And that's, it's just been, it relieves a lot of stress too, because you just let yourself off the hook from the beginning. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I also feel like if the stakes are ever low enough to try the other thing, it will either work or not work. Yeah. And you know, some I, you know, when you're up against time, that can be stressful. But like, let's try the th the thing that there's conflict. Let's try one version of that and see where it goes. And that's often been a useful way to like then come around to well, actually, I don't to all see that that was or was not the answer. Uh, so yeah, anything from the group now? I see Danielle and then, and then yeah. Hi, uh, Martine, one thing you brought up at the beginning was about combating bias and anonymous submissions in like the reading process, and I wonder if you could just speak more about that and what you've done in that work. You're old. Uh, yes. So, number one, I just want to let you know that we are actually uh, LMDA uh, both Jenna Rogers, our VP for EDNI, and Phaedra, uh, our, our VP for programs, have been working on actually putting together a resource in order to do that. So that will actually be something that will appear on our website not too long in the future. So, number one, there's that. Uh, so just know that uh, these are my thoughts, but then I think in some ways we're also collecting best practices that will eventually be a resource that you can tap into. But essentially part of uh, what I do is, in, you know, in some ways it's like pretty much Dramaturgy 101, but in some ways if, if I'm getting resistance, for example, about a particular play, like sometimes like even just with the process I'm talking about, maybe two of us really love a play and another person doesn't love a play, uh, the question then becomes, okay, what is it about the play that you're not responding to? Is it uh, an experience? Is it, is it outside of your cultural competency and therefore you feel like, because I, I find that sometimes the conversations, and this is not necessarily like a Great Plains Theater Conference issue, this is just sometimes the issue in general. If it is outside of your understanding of realm, uh, uh, your realm of understanding, people will say, well, that's not real. And, and, you're, and you're like, okay, but what experience are you bringing to the table to say that's not a real thing? And, and asking those questions, and obviously doing it in a respectful way, but asking the question, like, why, why does this not feel real to you? And I'll be the first one to back up some stuff with some, with some facts. So, <laughs> like, if you say that this story doesn't make sense to you, okay, here are other stories in other forms that, you know, go along with the same narrative. Okay, so now that we've established that this is a real thing, what is your issue with the play? You know what I mean? And I mean, I'm not, I, I know it sounds like I'm being like sassy with this, but it's, it's not actually like the process. I'm very kind, I promise. But, but that's like the heart of it, which is like, let's get back into what are those, what are those things that you're resisting, asking those questions. Um, and then I think also, uh, uh, one of the things that I think is always just really important is to like get people to confront their own either lack of cultural competency, their own lack of understanding about gender, those things. And so I've been in situations where I've asked people to do a little bit of research on their own. And the reason why I say that is I think the act of making someone do it is far sometimes more enlightening to someone in, in a process, in a journey, than to say, here, read these things. Because I mean, I think, you know, I think maybe some of this is also just like me being a university professor. And I know that sometimes I hand 
people stacks of things to read and then it sits in a pile and it never gets touched again and it starts to collect dust and maybe it becomes the fire that burns the whole building down. So, <laughs> and I mean that both in a physical and in a, <laughs> like, <laughs> both, both ways. Um, and so uh, those questions, but I think really it's about asking people where they are, like where are we when we have a conversation about what plays or, or uh, important to us at any given moment? Like, why are we fighting for a particular play or not for a particular play? And, um, and it's interesting because uh, I just had a similar experience. This was in an educational setting where I was asked to be a respondent to some plays. And there was a, a, a gentleman who had written a play that had a very circular structure, but the program itself is very much about a linear mode of storytelling and so like it was really interesting watching even the other students talk about it because they're like oh like this this play like eh, this play and then i watched and i was like it's brilliant what are y'all talking about and like it really was about having the conversation like what is it you know like this this actually does a circular structure perfectly so if we're talking about like a well-made play this like this nailed it so so what what is the resistance you know so i think it's really just about interrogating that um, and, and as we put together that that group of, that uh, resource page, I'll make sure that we, um, or when I say I'll make sure, I will politely ask Jeremy to make sure that, <laughs> as our VP for communications, to let people know that that resource exists. So hopefully we'll do a little blast about that. So, yeah. And the blue spot that there's a question. Hi. Uh, in the vein of, I mean, Jerry kind of saying that this is a meant to be a panel about conversation and learning and teaching to each other, um, I'm just curious about kind of your thoughts on how we can continue to propagate this knowledge in kind of more tangible avenues for learning and teaching. I know obviously there are like fellowship programs for dramaturgy and uh, grad school programs and things like that, but I was just curious about whether you have any thoughts on what other ways there are to kind of build this knowledge within the community. You know, I I will say this more more as a philosophy as opposed to knowing how to activate it, and hopefully that's something that we can build together. But I do think, in response to the, this of it, you know, I I always find. LMDA conference is so meaningful and enlightening in terms of what it means to hold dramaturgy as a collective and be able to share practice. And, you know, I said earlier that playwriting can be very isolating. Dramaturgy can also be very isolating as well. And in terms of, you know, when you're often the one dramaturg on a project or the one resident dramaturg in a company or however, you know, your role is held. And so there is, a, you know, a curiosity for me in what are more ways in which we can have cohort building knowing that there may not always be access to physically be together, but are there other forums or platforms, you know, uh, and I know this is something that's being discussed with, in LMDA in terms of, you know, from the listserv to other forums that we can actually hold around topics that we can have. Uh, and then I also, I'm really curious about other forms of, of training methodologies. You know, I do consider myself a lifelong learner, and I feel like I had this gift of, you know, at a point in my career, the number of internships, fellowships, and then suddenly the mentorship does not feel as supported even though I desperately need it still, you know, regardless of what my position and title is. And with New Play Dramaturgy, I've especially found um, such benefit in being able to learn from playwrights. And so uh, this is actually something that Luis Alfaro and I have talked about, you know, can there be New Play Dramaturgy, you know, uh, training sessions of some kind where dramaturgs and playwrights kind of co-lead sessions in different region so that it is actually shared in that conversation and that's something that I think would be very exciting. Yeah. I actually did get more practical than I thought. I thought I wouldn't but thanks to Luis Alfaro who reminded me there's a practical way. <laughs> I've also had the thought in the past couple of weeks since Jeremy was talking about this um, or at least I'm curious about my own uh, not 
owning but uh, being more reflective about my own work. I'm kind of curious if, I mean, rehearsals are long and days are long, and so the idea of going home and writing a, a log in terms of what I've done or what's happened doesn't necessarily sound a lot of fun, but in, uh, I think it might be really instructive for me at this point um, in terms of just being a bit more aware of what it is. And I think that also might lead to potentially being able to share and discuss it more because those things, I mean, it, especially when you go to a festival and it's a very short period of time, things happen really quickly and then I find that I don't remember them. I had a, a wise, ways back that a play, uh, one, an actor who had been in a work festival that I'd worked on messaged me saying, oh, I loved that article that you shared during the festival, and I hadn't even remembered giving it out. And uh, I was like, I'm not even sure which article that was. He was like, it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, but I think that it might be a, an interesting way to see, uh, I mean, the production notebooks, I remember when reading those, that those are kind of a narrative often of the entire experience of a piece, which I think is curious. But what would it be like if um, I, write about my experience and with whom could I then share that to get their feedback or might reflect better or be able to communicate. I remember one time at a festival someone said, we're assigning you a dramaturg to shadow you and I felt like... <laughs> uh, so that was a little bit tricky to feel um, really empowered about, but I think maybe with a bit more reflection it's a little bit easier to then connect with people and reflect back. Really quickly, another thing in terms of a tangible thing, and this is literally just something that it's in its infancy that we've been bouncing around, but we've been talking about starting a drunk dramaturgy series, <laughs> which I think would be amazing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, speaking of like sort of tangible ways you can get some dramaturgs to talk about what they what, what they do. <laughs> so I, I, I think there are all sorts of ways that, and we've also talked about, you know, on, on sort of like, flip side, uh, thinking about more open access in terms of dramaturgy, like we were talking about using the SUNY platform, because um, SUNY has uh, open SUNY, and maybe like creating some content that could be like sort of creating essentially like dramaturgy modules um, on, for example, different types of dramatic structures, things like that and having that as a resource that can be done, and part of me wants to do that in conjunction with dra dra dramaturgy, because that would just be awesome. Like, drunk dramaturgy while people are trying to make <laughs> these videos. So, okay, you gotta share more about this dramaturgy. <laughs> so, like, dramaturgs are drinking, and... Well, basically, uh, <laughs> in, in almost like the same sort of format as like drunk history, where like, yeah. essentially we get a bunch of dramaturgs together, give them a scenario that they have to then <laughs> do. <laughs> So we'll, we'll see if I ever can manage to get that off the ground. It might be a past president <laughs> thing, but... Right. Did you have, did I see other hands up? Did I just add on to the, the practicality thing real quick? Yes. Um, I'm just going to talk loud. Jillian Walker, um, who is a New York City-based dramaturg, has made a Patreon where she actively chronicles what she's doing for new play processes. And if you pay like $5 a month, you basically get a behind the scenes look at what your dramaturgical process is like. I think that's a really fascinating way to earn money for your dramaturgy. Um, and also, uh, she's brilliant and fully deserves every single penny that is donated to her Patreon. So Jillian, uh, J-I-L-L-I-A-N, Walker, as in the act of walking. <laughs> Thank you. I would uh, like to throw another book out there, but first up, thank you. Skylar, I have to say, I think what you said is so important. You know, it's almost like being the canary in the room and understanding that maybe this isn't the time, but I can't tell you how many of my favorite dramaturgs have held on to a script because that is the time. And all of a sudden, everybody knows. Now. <laughs> now. So you must have a memory, and I, I'm so glad you said that. Uh, Emily, Emily, you said something about methodology and how do we teach it. Uh, as an old fart, please guys, never stop learning, lifelong learning. And, and it, you can't bring the world into the room if you're not constantly alert to the world. And we have many more problems with scripts 
than understanding the patriarchy and a thousand other things. I, I actually think this is, and this is why I'm forecasting, teaching, sorry. But here's the, my answer to your question. If you want to know a good way to teach your students how important it is to be the person in the room who can bring the world in the room, pick 10 plays and pick 10 lines, a line from every play that if they don't understand what that line means, you probably should not be dramaturging that play. Mm. Uh, and I'll take, I'm just going to pull something random. If, if you're doing Hamlet and you don't understand the difference between using rapiers, which they would have used in his time, or using broadswords, which they would have used in Hamlet's time, and how that changes the scene because now there's no tip, with no point to come off, which means that you do not discover that somebody just went after you with a sword with no tip, which means they're trying to kill you because there's poison on it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it historically accurately, it changes the whole thing. If you don't know that, you can't help your director. Okay? If you don't know from Man for All Seasons, the line, the bitch that got over the wall, you, you can't do that because you don't understand why this great man's best friend is trying to get him to go along with Henry VIII, right? And say it's okay for him to not be Catholic anymore so he can have a divorce because if you don't know that one of those six wives is that guy's cousin, that's why he turns on his best friend. Because he wants his, I mean, actually she's his niece, right? You understand what I'm saying? There's stuff there and, and I'll make it. So pick those lines because you, you can't really understand what's really happening in that room if you don't know that there's, I'll go back to that play, there's a reason why, you know, you have this brilliant man who's one of the nicest people in history but doesn't want to give up his Catholicism for Henry VIII. Right. And wear, yet, he's rude to his wife. Thank you, Cindy. I wear, uh, quick, just really quick, gotta tell the answer. She's the second wife. Most people don't know that. And she's we are not also prepared to transport this play now. <laughs> but, okay, but, but you all see what I'm saying? Yes. Give them an assignment where they have to figure out what that line in the play means, and then they'll see how much they can't help if they don't really know the world of that play. I think it's, it's, it's our job, guys, it's our job. Um, we're at time, I saw some other hands, but I'm excited that that means that the conversation can keep going. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for sitting here. And you have some business? I think we have some, I want to get a business.